Well, she definitely ain't pretty. And she's got more hours on her than a Amish sawmill, but I think it's gonna do the job. Bought this rig all the way in Idaho, sight unseen. And so far, I think it's actually maybe in a little bit better shape than I expected, so can't really complain about that. But the idea here is really not to fix the thing up. I mean, you could work on just about every part and piece of this wore out piece of shit. That's really not the plan. I just need to get it good enough to go to work. And if I can get about 500 hours out of it with no major catastrophes, then that's all I'm really trying to do. Looks like I'm gonna need a couple tires, maybe three. But anyway, I haven't really done much with this since it showed up. Probably need to get it fired up and test on it just a little bit, see what problems we do have and what problems we don't have. At least I've got some parts. That's a D400 E Series 2 front section there. And this is a D400 E Series 2 here. That was part of my plan. So 3406 E power, seven speed planetary auto shift or power shift or whatever you want to call it. I noticed that this is not the original engine to the truck. This truck was built with 9AP300 and something, and this is 9AP1341. So it's had an engine swap at some point. Now this engine's got some blow by. It's not real, real bad, but it's not real good either. It's gonna be good enough for now though. Looks like the exhaust manifold and turbo are newer. Not sure what the story is there, but I guess that can't be a bad thing. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 21,000 hours on it. Air filter looks brand new. May not even have to change that. Pre-cleaner's on, ready to go. And uh, this is what I'm gonna have back here. That's a six inch OD pipe. So this is the tip that's supposed to go on top of the muffler. That'll fit right on there like that. So I should be about ready to fire it up. Uh, it's got oil in it, I already checked it. Let's see what the coolant looks like. I haven't looked in here yet. Looks pretty good, shouldn't have to do anything with that. Already spotted something here that's gotta be fixed. operation and maintenance manual here there's a couple brake tests we can do here to see how strong the brakes are so the first one's the service brake test what you do is release the parking brake put it in first gear ever up to 1550 and it shouldn't move and then the secondary brake test is pretty much the same thing but you apply the parking brake and you only go to 1200 rpm and it shouldn't move there either so we'll go try her out
want to call that good on the brake test. Got her pulled up here, getting ready to do a little pressure washing. I'm not going to get real carried away, but just going to try to get it cleaned up the best that I reasonably can. That's the transmission right there. Alright, it ain't clean, but it's better than it was. Good as it's gonna get for now. So they've got these shields over the brake lines, fittings and stuff in here. There's one of them. I'm gonna pull those shields off and get these brakes cleaned up good. I'm sure there's a bunch of mud and rocks and stuff packed under those shields. I guess I should probably explain that these are hydraulic brakes. You've got brakes on the center axle here. So those are the lines going over to that wheel. And then there's brakes on the front axle. None on the rear axle. Got shields up here too. I'll pull those off and clean it up underneath them. I've got the front axle a lot better than what it was. Shields off of this one. There's some rocks that fell out. There's one here. I'll get all that cleaned up and put these shields back on. Probably won't fill much more of this. We'll uh, wait till we get to doing something a little more interesting. All right, I've got this access panel swung down. That's the secondary steering pump and motor right there. That's a backup to the main steering pump, which is a big piston pump that's driven off the engine up there. So uh, in the event that that main steering pump loses pressure for whatever reason, this will take over and provide enough pressure so that you can still steer the machine. There's the engine oil filter. I don't really understand why this engine's got the blow-by that it does because everything about it appears to be pretty fresh. That's a fresh Cat Reman starter, fresh Reman ECM. I'm wondering if this ain't a whole Cat Reman engine that they put in here. But anyway, what I'm doing is trying to get to the little access port in the flywheel housing so that I can stick a turning tool in there and roll the engine around so I can run the overhead. Finally got in here and got the cover plate and the plug out of it. So I'll show you what I'm working with here. The big hole is where the turning tool goes in and meshes with the flywheel. And that's how you turn the engine or rotate it. And then the little hole beside it is where the pin goes in. Well, I got pretty lucky on this. I bet I didn't rotate that turning tool half a revolution and it fell in. So. It's pinned at top dead center compression number one or top dead center compression number six right now. I won't know which till I get up there and get the valve covers off. But uh, that was good. At least I didn't have to rotate it very far. I'll have to rotate it all the way around once to do the other half of the engine, but that's better than having to rotate it almost all the way around twice. Well, I got a little surface rust on the jakes, but it's not really a big deal. Reman injectors. Looks like a new injector harness. 
But anyway, uh, I'm on top dead center compression number one. I know that because I've got lash there and here. And I don't over here on number six, they're tight. Number one is pretty good. 15 thousandths there on the intake valves. I'm happy with that. 30 thousandths on the exhaust here. Pretty happy with that too. No reason to break them loose and adjust them if they're already good. I probably won't video much of this. There's really nothing to see. You're just breaking nuts loose, running feeler gauges under there, adjusting them and tightening them back up and then on to the next one. So I'll show you how the injectors adjust and the jakes though before I finish up here. All right, I'm on number three injector here. So the 3406E, C15, C16, C18 engine family are what's known as EUI or uh, electronic unit injector engines. So each one of these is an electronic unit injector and each one of them gets adjusted individually. That's what I'm doing right now. now. The way this works, you've got what they call the injector height tool, which is this thing. It's a 9U7227 part number if you're looking for one. And each injector body has got a machined ledge. I think you can see that when it's down in there in between the two valve springs, just on this side of the injector spring. It looks kind of like a little half moon shape. Probably pretty hard to see with this light. You can see that one there. So the foot on the bottom of this injector height tool rides on that machined ledge. And then it's got a push rod that comes up and the top of the push rod comes through the top of the tool here. And it's got like two levels on it. So what you want is for the injector to be adjusted to where it's somewhere in between those two levels. So this one, for example, the top level is just barely protruding through the tool and the lower level is recessed down into the tool a little way, so that's in adjustment. The lash on the jakes is checked in between the slave piston push rod and the machined area on the top of the exhaust valve rocker arm, just like that. And then if you needed to make an adjustment, which I don't, this one's good, but you would break this nut loose, you'd screw the adjuster down until it was tight, and then you'd slowly back it off until you got it to where you needed it to be, and then retighten the nut. All right, I've got the overhead all adjusted and it's ready to go. I only ended up making a couple little adjustments, so it was pretty close to begin with. It would have been fine, but now I know it's good to go. And normally I would have replaced these Jake housing slash rocker shaft bolts with the thicker shanked updated ones, but being that this engine's already pretty tired and I'm just looking to get a little bit more life out of it, I'm not going to mess with it. I did go ahead and retorque them so they're all good and tight. And uh, it'll be fine for a while longer. So that's pretty much it for up here. I'll get the valve covers thrown back on it and uh, move on to the next thing. Look at this transmission oil. Yeah, that's not good. It doesn't look as bad in real life as it looks in this video, but it's still pretty bad. I've seen worse, but that'll have to be changed before it goes to work. All right, this is the transmission magnetic screen under this little cover plate right here. We'll see what it looks like. Hopefully we don't find any metal chunks. There's a wavy washer here. but I figured I can't get it out. There's a little cover plate on top I'll have to pull off and I can pull that out of there. Here's the screen and the magnets. So the good news is I don't see any big chunks of metal or anything too scary anywhere. There's some fine particles there, but that's pretty normal. What you really don't want to see is any big chunks and I'm not seeing that anywhere so 
I'm sure the old tranny has seen better days, but I don't think we're having catastrophic failure of anything yet. Oil doesn't look very good, but I'll get that changed out and uh, it'll probably be all right. Had a damned old tornado out here back in the summer. Took these two trees down. That's exactly what I thought was going to happen. We're gonna take care of this milkshake looking transmission oil. I've got it warmed up. Oh shit. Yeah, that is not good.
That's a magnetic plug. There's nothing on the bottom of that. Very scary. Fine particles, but. So that's all right. Drop this belly pan down so I can pull this torque converter screen out of here. We'll check that screen out and uh, that need to be dropped anyway to get the rest of the bad oil out before I put the good oil in. Transmission back there has been draining overnight. Nothing too bad on that screen either. New transmission filter. Torque converter suction screen all cleaned up, ready to go back in. All right, got the belly pan swung back up there. And well, let me tell you, Swinging that 225 pound piece of shit up there and putting the bolts in by yourself is not very much fun. But everything's together now. The only thing left to do before I put the new oil in is to put the drain plug back in and it's ready to be filled up. Got 15 gallons of the proper and approved oil here. All 280 some dollars worth. Transmission filters on. So even though I've got this bad transmission oil changed out for some fresh clean oil, it would be kind of nice to know how the water got in this oil in the first place. I know a lot of you are probably screaming that it's a bad transmission oil cooler, but I really don't think that's the case. I've dealt with quite a few bad oil coolers in the past. And in my experience, when you mix Cat Red ELC, which is what's in that engine out there, with a clear or semi-clear oil of this type, you're gonna get more of a strawberry milkshake effect like that. That's Cat Red ELC mixed with some of the fresh clean oil that I just put in the transmission. You can see that that's totally different from that. There ain't no strawberry in this at all. So this looks like what you would expect to see just from mixing water with this type of oil. So with what I got and what I'm trying to do here, I think the best course of action is just to run it, keep an eye on it, and hope that it doesn't happen again. You didn't think I was gonna give up that easy, did you? I don't think we're going anywhere. It's a little greasy out here, but I'll give her a shot.
was gonna quit, but it moved. So that means I gotta keep trying. I got her. Almost destroyed my new phone, but keyword there is almost. Pretty good sized tree, too. Well, after going back and watching that video, it looks like the old inner axle differential lock ain't quite holding. Inner axle differential is the one in between the front axle and the two rear axles. I had it all locked up. I mean, the front axle was pulling pretty hard, but it wasn't solidly locked. It wasn't pulling hard enough to spin them the whole time, but I think that's a clutch pack type lock and it's probably just worn out and slipping a little. So that's all right. I don't expect too many problems with mud where I'm going. Should be fine for now. But anyway, I told you this thing came out of Idaho. So when I got it bought, shot a message over to old Jay Pater, being that he lives out that way, looking for a heavy haul truck to put it on to get it here. And sure enough, about a day later, he had me a guy found, uh, sent me his number, and it all worked out, and the old boy brought her to me. So if you're not watching Jay Paydirt, J-P-A-Y-D-I-R-T is his channel name. Go check him out. Good guy. And uh, he's got dozer videos. And YouTube loves dozer videos. I think he's bought two different D9Hs in the last month. So go check that out. She's got 21,717.8 hours showing right now. So it'll be interesting to see how much longer it lasts and what blows up first. But anyway, I guess that's all I've got for this one. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.